Welcome back to your last week of new material. This is Physics 235, week 14, day one, scheduled for release on April 20th. And today we're going to talk about other kinds of interference. And we're going to start by talking about something called multi-slit interference. Multi-slit interference is going to be an awful lot like double-slit interference except that we will have more than two slits, so anywhere from three to an arbitrarily large number of slits. And I want to start by looking at an image from your textbook to try to explain this phenomenon. Here we see a diagram from your textbook that shows the simplest form of multi-slit interference, where we have three slits. And you can see that a lot of the same types of things are going to be happening. When we compare ray 1 and ray 2 to each other, the distance d sine theta will still be the path length difference. And we can see that by looking at this triangle right here, where if we assume the rays are parallel, then that extra side on the bottom right here is the path length difference, which is d sine theta. Now we will also see the same thing when we compare ray 2 and ray 3, which can be shown by the following triangle down here between rays 2 and 3, again with a right angle here, where this side here is the path length difference between ray 2 and ray 3, and that's equal to d sine theta. The additional complexity here is going to come when we try to compare ray 1 to ray 3 directly, because there the path length difference is going to be 2d sine theta. And that can be seen by the triangle I am drawing in purple right now. We can see that the path length difference, which is going to be the distance along this bottom side of the triangle, is going to be equal to the path length difference from rays 1 and 2 plus the path length difference from rays 2 and 3. Or we could just do our trigonometry directly with the purple triangle and get that this bottom side, the path length difference between ray 1 and ray 3, is 2d sine theta. So I want to talk through this situation under a couple different scenarios. So the first one is, what if d sine theta is already an integer multiple of wavelengths? In other words, in this situation, if we just took ray 1 and ray 2, we would be at a point of constructive interference. And if you compare ray 2 to ray 3, we are at constructive interference. But we also have to look at the comparison between ray 1 and ray 3 to see the full story. Here, rays 1 and 3 have a path length difference of 2d sine theta. And if we already saw before that the path length difference between adjacent rays for this hypothetical scenario is already equal to m lambda, then 2d sine theta just has to be equal to 2m times lambda. And if m is an integer, then 2m is also an integer so rays 1 and 3 also constructively interfere. So adding a third slit didn't really change anything about the bright spots on our pattern, our interference pattern on the walls. So our bright spots will still be in the same place. But what if d sine theta were not equal to m lambda? What if adjacent rays were destructively interfering with each other? Or what if d sine theta is m plus a half times a wavelength? So in this case, rays 1 and 2 will have a path length difference between them of some half integer wavelength, so they will destructively interfere with each other, completely destructively interfere. And rays 2 and 3 will have the same thing. They'll have a path length difference between the two of them of half an integer number of wavelengths, so rays 2 and 3 will completely destructively interfere with each other. 
And again, we have to consider rays 1 and 3, the pairing that wouldn't be here if this were just a double slit experiment. And here, the path length difference is still going to be 2d sine theta. And we know from our relationship that we started our hypothetical situation with that d sine theta is equal to m plus a half times the wavelength. So that means that 2d sine theta is going to give us 2m plus 1 times our wavelength. So I've just taken m plus a half times the wavelength and multiplied that by 2. Well, if m is an integer, then 2m plus 1 is also an integer. So this means rays 1 and 3 constructively interfere. So when we look at the situations that gave us constructive interference with just two slits, we still get constructive interference when we add a third slit. But when we look at a situation that gave us completely destructive interference with just two slits, well now we have at least rays 1 and 3 are constructively interfering. And what this means in terms of the interference pattern is that we will get a bright spot here, but it won't be as bright as the main bright spots. So to really explain what I mean by these additional bright spots, I'm going to not only introduce some new terminology, but I'm going to put a new diagram on the board here. So here I have another diagram from your book, which shows on the left the diagrams of intensity versus position for two slits, three slits, and four slits, as well as over here on the right, the actual interference patterns we might expect to see. So let's start thinking about the double slit first. For the double slit, as we did before, we have bright spots alternating with dark spots, and that is all that there is. And on our intensity graph, you can see that we have a maxima here, and then the graph goes down to a minima and then back up to a maxima here. So these bright spots that I've labeled with the red dots correspond with each of these red arrows over here on the actual picture of what the interference pattern would look like. So now let's think about three slits, and I'll mark this one up in green. So for our three slits, we still have our major maxima in the same location. These are called the principal maxima. And these are the maxima that are in the same exact place they were before. So on our picture to the right here, these thicker bright spots that I'm labeling with green dots, these are our principal maxima. But then we also have the additional maxima, the one where the adjacent slits gave us destructive interference, but slits 1 and 3 out of the three total slits gave us also constructive interference. So we also have this down here that I'm labeling in yellow. This is that secondary maximum we talked about. And the secondary maxima I've labeled in yellow here are specifically for n equals 3. So we have these, these spots I'm going to label in yellow on this diagram over here. You can see that slightly lighter but still bright fringe in there. So that red line right here is our secondary maxima. And the secondary maxima are by their very name, secondary to the principal maxima. They are not as bright, and they are dimmer by a predictable factor. The intensity of secondary maxima is a factor of 1 over n squared lower than the intensity of principal maxima. So that little dot that I labeled in yellow right here and here, well, this was for the n equals 3 diagram when there were three slits. So that means these yellow points here are a factor of 9 smaller than the primary or the principal maxima labeled in green here. 
And this process will continue. We didn't actually do the mathematics of four slits, but with four slits, you get the same idea. You still get principal maxima that I'm going to label here in, we'll go with blue. So we have our principal maxima here, here, and here, which can be labeled on our diagram as those bright spots and continuing on to the outside. But now we will also have some secondary maxima here that I'm going to label in orange. And you'll note that for n equals 3, we only had one secondary maxima in between our principal maxima. But for n equals 4, we now have two secondary maxima in between our principal maxima. So you can see those one of them right here and one of them right here. In between every principal maxima, there are now two secondary maxima. So we can write this in words in the following way. So there are n minus 2 secondary maxima between any two adjacent primary maxima. So since n equals 4 for the 4 slit, 4 minus 2 is 2, so there are two secondary maxima between every primary maxima. And if you want to see why this is, well, with three slits, we looked at m times lambda and m plus one half times lambda as our two cases, where one of them gave us the principal maxima and the other one gave us the secondary maxima. The same idea will hold true for four slits as well, but now rather than trying to find numbers to add to m that will make ray 1 and ray 3 constructively interfere, we want to find ways to make ray 1 and ray 4 constructively interfere. So we still have path length differences between adjacent slits of m lambda will still give you our principal maxima. But we'll have two different ways to get secondary maxima. That could be either m plus a third times the wavelength or m plus two thirds times the wavelength. So we'll get two secondary maxima there and you could grind through the math to check that yourself. Just to clarify what these numbers I've written in red here are, this is the path length difference between two adjacent slits. Eventually, we will return to this idea when we talk about the single slit interference pattern and when we talk about diffraction gratings. But for now, at least you know how to handle situations where there are more than two slits. The next kind of interference I want to talk about is thin film interference which is what you get when you see rainbows in soap bubbles or rainbows in oil films on water. And the fundamental idea of thin film interference is that there are three materials stacked very close together where the middle material is very thin. So in a bigger diagram here, we'll have three different materials. Not always different, but the middle one will always at least be different, with N1 at the top, N2 in the middle, and N3 at the bottom. And since this is thin film interference, this middle layer is going to be thin and has a thickness that we are going to call T. And the light waves will interfere in the following way. An incident light ray comes in towards the first surface and then that light ray will refract and pass into the middle surface. Now some of this light ray when it reaches the third surface will just pass on through, but that's not the portion that we're going to be worried about right now. It's not gonna come into our interference, so I'm going to ignore that one. I mentioned when I talked about Snell's Law that every time there's refraction, there's also at least a little bit of reflection. And when we were talking about Snell's law, we didn't bother drawing these reflected rays because they weren't the light rays that we cared about. And now we're going to do the reverse. We don't care about the refracted light ray that passes through the soap bubble because it's not going to cause our interference. But the portion of this light ray that reflects off of the boundary between material 2 and material 3 is going to be important. 
and then that light ray will emerge back into material one here at the top. But hold on a minute, you might be saying, and I hope you are. Well, if every time refraction happens, sometimes light is reflected, or at least some of the light is reflected, then what about this part up here where our incident ray hit the surface? And you're exactly right. There will be a reflected portion of this light right here. And the idea here is that this red ray is going to interfere with this blue ray. So the light that reflects off of the top boundary is going to interfere with light that reflects off the bottom boundary. So as we've always done before, we want to write some sort of expression for our path length difference. And to see what this path length difference is, I need to clarify that the diagram I drew over here is not precisely correct. I've drawn the light rays traveling along diagonal paths so that they can be separated from each other and truly drawn into a single image more clearly. But what's really happening is the incident light ray comes straight down and the reflected portion reflects straight back up and then the portion that passes into material two goes down, bounces off of that surface, and comes out directly on top of the red ray. So this right here is what actually happens even though it doesn't make for as good of a diagram. So from this, look at the picture and ask yourself, how much extra distance does the blue ray travel compared to the red ray? Well, the red ray bounces right off of the surface, and then from that point, the blue ray travels down to the second surface and back up, a distance of 2 times the thickness. So the path length difference is 2t, so we're done, right? We can just say that if this path length difference is m lambda, then we will get constructive interference. And if this path length difference is m plus a half lambda, then we get destructive interference. Right? Turns out the answer is sometimes, but not always. So I am going to cross out these formulas that we just wrote for constructive and destructive interference. The path length difference is still two times the thickness, but there's something additional going on here that I want to remind you of that happens in those reflections. And to motivate the idea of what I'm going to talk about, which is a phase shift, remember when we talked about physical waves, waves on strings, and those waves reflecting from boundaries. Whether the reflected wave was inverted or upright depended on whether it was a fixed or a free boundary. And the same thing happened when we tied strings with two different linear mass densities together. If you sent a wave pulse towards that point where the ropes are stitched together, some of the wave would reflect back the way it came from that boundary, sometimes inverted, sometimes not. So let's dig out the old figures from that section of the textbook and explore those a minute. So here we have those two diagrams from, uh, this would be volume one, chapter 16, figures 17 and 18. So when we had a wave pulse right here coming in to our fixed boundary, the reflected wave was inverted. It was upside down compared to the original wave. And that was when we had a fixed boundary, like tying a string to an eyelet or to a wall or to a pole so that the end of the string can't move. But down here, further below, we had again a wave pulse coming into some boundary, but the reflected wave was upright because we had a free boundary. So in short, sometimes when a wave is reflected, it is phase shifted by pi or inverted or slid 180 degrees forward or back in its oscillation or a trough becomes a peak and a peak becomes a trough. 
And we have the same idea happening over here on the right, where our wave pulse was approaching a boundary between two different materials. The thicker line represents a higher value of mu, in this case, the linear mass density. So like before, in some cases, we can have a reflected wave that is inverted. And in some cases, we can have a reflected wave that is upright. And the difference here comes when the boundary is free versus fixed, or in the case of the two different linear mass density strings, is the wave about to encounter a material with a higher linear mass density, or is the wave about to encounter a material with a lower linear mass density? That's what makes the difference here. So I want to remove these images I've just put on here and start to talk about how this applies to light specifically. If it was the linear mass density of the string that made the difference for a wave on a string, it's going to be the index of refraction that makes a difference for light waves. So we have two possible situations here. One of them is when the light, as in the left image, bounces off of a second material, and that material it bounces off of has an index of refraction that is higher than the material the light is currently traveling in. And in this situation, you do get a 180 degrees or a pi radians phase shift. But in this other situation over here, where the light is again in N1 and bouncing off of N2, but N2 is smaller than N1, in this situation, we get no phase shift. So pull up those images I was showing you before from back in unit one, and compare that to the different linear mass densities of the string. When you encountered a higher linear mass density, the reflected wave was inverted or phase shifted. When the wave pulse encountered a lower linear mass density section, the reflected wave was not inverted. It was upright. It was not phase shifted. And just to clarify, because in addition to reflection happening, there is also a couple of points of refraction happening, that there is never any phase shift for refraction. So there's actually a handy mnemonic to remember the stuff that I've just drawn, basically to remember whether you get a pi phase shift or not. And that mnemonic is low to high, phase shift pi, high to low, phase shift no. So low to high and high to low here refers to the index of refraction. So in this first situation, N1 is smaller, so this is the low index of refraction, and N2 down here is the high index of refraction. So the light is attempting to go from low index of refraction, and it's running into a higher index of refraction. So this is the low to high phase shift pi part. For our other version, N1 is bigger than N2. So the light is coming in from the high index of refraction side and is going to bounce off of the low index of refraction side. So this is the high to low phase shift no. So, whether or not our rules that we drew up in here in purple and then crossed off will actually be true or not depends on whether there is a phase shift at this top surface and whether there is a phase shift at this bottom surface. If neither of them are phase shifted, our rules will be exactly as we wrote them in purple. Or if both of them are phase shifted, our rules will be exactly as we wrote them in purple. The biggest difference being is if one of the reflections is phase shifted and the other one is not. So let me write that all down in words, or equations rather. So these are the equations you can box for thin film interference. So if the phase shift is the same at both surfaces, we get what we normally expect. The path length difference is equal to m lambda gives us constructive interference. 
But if we have a different phase shift at both surfaces, if one of them gives us a pi phase shift and the other one does not, then that takes what would have been constructive interference before, shifting one of the waves by half of a wavelength now makes that destructive. So we still have an m lambda and an m plus a half lambda, but which one is constructive and which one is destructive switches if we have a phase shift at both surfaces. There is also one additional complexity here that I want to mention real quick. This wavelength that we've been talking about the whole time is now a little bit fuzzy. When light passes from one medium to another with a different index of refraction, it slows down. So the speed of the wave decreases. And the frequency of a wave times the wavelength of a wave always gives you the speed that that wave travels. So the frequency of light does not change when light enters a new medium, but the wavelength does. So whatever light we're talking about is going to have a different wavelength in N1, in N2, and in N3. And all of these wavelengths that we've written have to be the wavelength in a specific material, and that's going to be material 2. So I'm going to put an N2 next to each of these wavelengths. So first, you need to find out what wavelength you have in N1 and use that to figure out what the wavelength will be in N2 for the purposes of these, of these calculations. So you can always find lambda N2 by whatever the regular wavelength is in a vacuum and dividing that by N2. So I want to do a quick calculation here as an example. So we're going to have green light incident on a soap bubble filled with air, and we want to know the smallest thickness of the bubble that will create constructive interference for green light. So to draw our diagram here, we have at the top and at the bottom air and the thin film in between the layers of air is the soap, or rather the soapy water. So we're assuming it has the same index of refraction as water. So our light is going to come into this surface. Some of it will travel down to the bottom boundary and bounce back up, and then head back out, and some of it will just bounce directly off of the surface at the top. So we need to examine our phase shifts so that we know which of the equations from the previous slide to use. So first let's look at light striking this boundary right here. The light is in a low index of refraction and is about to bounce off of a high index of refraction. So this is low to high and we get a phase shift of pi. Then when we look at this other boundary down here, this reflection, the light is already in the high index of refraction and is going to bounce off of a lower index of refraction. So this is high to low, which gives us no phase shift or zero phase shift. So the phase shift is different at the two surfaces. So we use these rules that our path length difference is a whole number of wavelengths will give us destructive interference, and a half integer number of wavelengths will give us constructive interference. So we can now start to write down our equations over here. Twice the thickness of the soap film will equal m plus one half times our wavelength, and we will need to solve this for t in order to find our thickness. So before you just go plugging things in, Lambda here is not equal to 540 nanometers because we need the wavelength inside of the soap. So we need to find the wavelength inside of the soap for the green light, which is going to be the original wavelength in a vacuum divided by the index of refraction of soap. Or our 540 nanometers divided by four-thirds, which is approximately 
So we get a wavelength here of green light within the soap bubble of 405 nanometers. And now we have to figure out which value of n we need. And we can determine this by coming back to the word smallest, the smallest thickness of soap bubble. There will be multiple possible answers here for different numbers of m, but if we want the smallest t, looking at our equation tells us we need the smallest m. And the smallest m you can have is 0. So we're now ready to actually plug in numbers. We have 2 times our thickness is going to be equal to 1 half times our modified wavelength of 405 nanometers. So our thickness is going to be equal to our modified wavelength divided by 4, which turns out to be 101.25 nanometers. Hopefully the wavelength over 4 makes sense here. As the Blu-ray travels down through this thickness that we've discovered is equal to half, or sorry, a quarter of the relevant wavelength. So the Blu-ray travels down an extra half of a wave, sorry, down an extra quarter of a wavelength, and then up an extra quarter of a wavelength. So in terms of actual extra distance it's traveled, it's traveled an extra half of a wavelength. But we also get a half of a wavelength from this phase shift difference, that one of the boundaries had a phase shift and the other one did not. So the extra half of a wavelength that's missing here is made up by that phase shift. The last kind of interference I want to talk about, at least briefly, is the Michelson interferometer and I want to show you guys a diagram of what that looks like. So this is the Michelson interferometer. Light is shined in from a laser through some screen, and then it reaches this piece labeled M, and this is a half silvered mirror, meaning half of the light is reflected and half of the light is refracted. So some of the light is reflected out here to mirror M1, and then that light bounces and comes straight back through the half-silvered mirror to the observer. The other path that light takes is some of the light is refracted and passes through mirror M down to mirror 2 back and bounces off of the mirror to the observer. And then the, that red ray and the blue ray will interfere with each other. And in this setup, one of our mirrors is fixed and the other mirror is movable. So if I can direct your attention to the second half of this diagram, mirror M1 is movable. It can be slid up and down in this diagram from our top view. But mirror M2 is fixed in place. So as before, we want to think about our path length difference. The path length difference is the most important thing to find if you're trying to investigate any kind of interference, and hopefully we've driven that home so far. We talked about sound, we talked about the double slit experiment, we've talked about the multiple slit interference, we've talked about thin film interference, and the Michelson interferometer, and in all of those, the first thing we did was figure out how do we find our path length difference, because after that, it gets simple, or simpler. So. The distance, the path length difference, will be the difference between light that travels along this path towards mirror 2 and light that travels along this path towards mirror 1. So those distances are given names. The distance to mirror 2 is labeled as D2, and the distance to mirror 1 is labeled as D1. So the length that light ray 1 travels is 2 D1. And the length that light ray 2 travels is 2 d2. And if we want to find the difference, we just subtract those two. So that path length difference that I'm going to call delta L here is equal to 2 d1 minus 2 d2. And as before, if that path length difference is a whole number of wavelengths, then we get constructive interference. And if it's a half integer number of wavelengths, we get destructive interference. But that's not usually how you use a Michelson interferometer. 
This is a picture of the interference pattern you get from a Michelson interferometer. You can see that it's more of a circular interference pattern. And what we're going to be paying attention to is what's going on right at the center of this diagram. So at the center of this pattern right now is a dark spot. So currently the intensity is at a minima or we're having destructive interference. But the Michelson interferometer, one of the things it's used for is precision distance measurements. So let's say we move mirror M1 a distance of delta D. Well, our interference pattern will change. So for every extra wavelength we give to the path length difference, a new maxima will appear in the center of our interference pattern. So we can move the mirror a distance of delta D and count the number of new bright fringes that appear. And we can use this formula for that. So M here is the number of bright fringes that appear or disappear at the center of this diagram. So by doing this, you're dealing with light. Light has wavelengths of hundreds of nanometers, so fractions of a micrometer. So you can reliably measure distances down to the precision of maybe half of a micrometer this way. So you can tell exactly how far mirror one moved. So if you have something that is very sensitive to small movements, you could potentially attach it to a Michelson interferometer where the object you need to move precise distances is attached to mirror one. And by examining the interference pattern, you will know very, very precisely how far mirror one had moved. The Michelson interferometer can also be used for other things, including measuring the index of refraction of a gas. And it would be used for this in the following way. So you can see this picture I've just added at the bottom represents a Michelson interferometer where one of our paths, this one time the one connected to mirror one, has a small chamber, a transparent chamber that light can go through that will be filled with that gas. So we know that wavelengths change when a material passes through a, a material with a different index of refraction. So we can set the Michelson interferometer up, one wave going this way, one light ray going this way to meet at the eye with this chamber filled with gas. Then you see that chamber is connected to a vacuum pump. So then you turn on the vacuum pump so that now all that's inside of this little chamber is vacuum. And you'll see new bright fringes appear. So you can then figure out exactly what the index of refraction of that material was in order to create that specific number of new bright fringes. Now you might notice that I've actually been calling this the Michelson interferometer, and usually I am not big on people's names from history. The history of physics is full of a bunch of old white dudes, and to while their discoveries are important and crucial for you to understand, really, in the words of another student in the class, who has time for more old white dudes? But I bring Michelson's name into it because Michelson was involved in what's usually called the most famous negative result or the most famous failed experiment in all of physics or all of science sometimes. And that's called the Michelson-Morley experiment. And the Michelson-Morley experiment was an attempt to explain some of the early observations of the results that would eventually be explained by special and general relativity. So length contraction and time dilation, and why would that happen? And Michelson and Morley's hypothesis was that there was something called the luminiferous ether, that the entire universe, including our solar system and Earth, were constantly moving through this ether wind. So depending on whether we were moving with the ether wind, against the ether wind, or perpendicular to the ether wind, then the different observed uh, phenomena from relativity would be explained that way. So this was the idea, that there was some luminiferous ether that was constantly blowing in some direction. 
And sometimes the path of Earth might be along the luminiferous ether. So right here, the Earth is traveling this direction with the luminiferous ether. Here, the Earth is traveling against the luminiferous ether, and at the other points, it would be traveling perpendicular to the luminiferous ether. So Michelson and Morley hypothesized that this could explain the observations that were the very beginnings of general relativity. So Michelson and Morley took a Michelson interferometer, and they figured, well, if we just rotate it 90 degrees, we should get a change in the number of central bright fringes on our interference pattern. So they tried that, but they didn't get extra bright fringes. So they decided, well, maybe we need to try it spread out over the course of a different year, of an entire year. So they tried it in spring, and they tried it in fall, and then they tried it in the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, on mountains, in valleys. They tried every version of this they could think of and never found anything. So Michelson and Morley's experiment could in some senses be called a failure because they did not find what they were looking for at all. But the Michelson-Morley experiment, though in some sense a failure, was actually a success. So as I believe Adam Savage says, uh, failure is always an option. You don't do science to prove yourself right. You do science to discover what is. And Michelson and Morley discovered that the luminous, luminiferous ether simply is not. And that paved the way for general and special relativity to come along later with Einstein and for the scientific community to be ready to accept that explanation since the luminiferous ether had been disproved by Michelson and Morley's experiment using a Michelson interferometer. There's nothing calculation-wise I really need you to do with respect to the Michelson and Morley experiment, but it's a very important experiment in the history of physics, and it's a good reminder that even a null result still has value in science. So just because you didn't find something you were hoping to find doesn't mean your research was of no value. So on that hopefully pleasant note, I wish you all a good day, and I will see you back here on Wednesday. Thank you for watching, and have a good day.